Welcome to the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast. I'm your host, Nicole, and this podcast is your guide to start creating a lifestyle by design. From entrepreneurship, money and finance, taxes and residencies, and everything in between, this show highlights the nuances of a true global citizen lifestyle. Let's dive in. Welcome back to another episode of the Work Wealth and Travel Podcast. And in today's episode, I sit down with Kevin. Now, he is the founder and the co host of Next Level University Podcast. And in his early life, and we talk about this, Kevin found quote unquote success. But after a brush with near suicide, he realized that he wasn't living a life that was truly aligned with him, which I can completely resonate with in a totally different way. And we dive into this in the episode. So he became passionate about self-improvement and decided to make it his purpose in life to impact as many people as possible to become a role model podcaster and speaker. In this episode, we dive into this and so much more. We dive into how he has grown his business strictly from his podcast his service offerings, and how he has created a lifestyle by design for himself. He has succeeded in making his podcast one of the top 100 shows with over 1,300 episodes and listened in over 125 countries. So let's dive into the episode. Kevin, I would love to hear a little bit more about you, your story, where you started, and how you got to where you are today. Yes. Well, first of all, Nicole, thank you so very much for having me. I appreciate it. The, the shortest version, and I'm sure we'll dive in, but today I am a podcast host, I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm a business owner. And our podcast is something that we do seven times a week. We have almost 1,400 episodes as of today, but that really is the biggest driver of our business and the reason we started this in the first place. For me, I grew up in a single parent household. I was raised by my mom and my grandmother. I didn't know my dad. I didn't meet my dad until I was 27. and I had an assumption that if I made a lot of money, that would fix all of my internal problems. I ended up making a lot of money, finding quote unquote success, having the dream body, the dream car, a model partner, all of those things. But I still ended up sitting on the edge of a bed contemplating suicide a few years later, ended up leaving the corporate side of things and starting this podcast and I ended up doing this full time as of 2018. So I've been a full time podcaster now since, and this is what we do for a living. So I get to podcast every day and we have a team and listeners all over the world. And at one point, that was all just a dream for me. And now I get to do it every single day. Wow. What a story. So I want to dive into that a little bit more um, because there's obviously a lot there. So what did, in terms of actually starting something for yourself, I know you've had Before your podcasting, you had a few other things that you were doing before that as well. So getting into the entrepreneurial space, what did that look like for you? What did starting something of your own look like? And then maybe what was that catalyst? I think maybe you briefly mentioned it, but I'd love to dive a little deeper as well. The catalyst for thinking, no, I need to make a change. And maybe that looks like entrepreneurship. Yeah, it's very interesting. I am not a quote unquote natural born entrepreneur. I never had a lemonade stand. I didn't have a paper route. I didn't have any of those things that that you hear about. I don't have a college degree. So it's not like I learned about business and entrepreneurship in college. So what happened was I achieved, like I said, I achieved in 2016, I had a very good year financially. And I had convinced myself that, okay, if I make a boatload of money, I'm going to be really confident. I'm going to be really secure. I'm going to have a ton of fulfillment, which I think we're all after at the end of the day, end up making the money. And then I said, interesting. I have my final pay stub in front of me, but I don't feel any different. For most of my life, I have lived unconsciously. I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm just showing up and kind of hoping for the best. The opposite of unconscious is hyperconscious. So I started a podcast called The Hyperconscious Podcast. At that point, it was purely passion. There was no thoughts about monetization. There was no thoughts about growth. There was no thoughts about entrepreneurship. I couldn't even spell it at the time. So that wasn't my focus. What ended up happening was I fell in love with the purpose. I fell in love with the impact. I fell in love with the passion and I fell out of love with my job. Just for context, I kind of lived like a nomad for four years, except I was just going wherever my company was telling me and I did not enjoy the not so nice places we were staying. So 
I end up making the money. I start the podcast. I fall in love with the podcast as I'm falling out of love with my job. And it just got to the point where I was living on the road again. I'm staying up super late, working long hours. And I just started to get this hopeless feeling that I'm going to be stuck at this job for the rest of my life. And I'm going to grow old here and I'm going to be miserable here and I'm never going to get to do my own thing. And honestly, that scared the crap out of me. So I kept working and I kept working, but I started calling out and I started leaving the job site early and I started to show up late. And eventually it got to the point where I woke up in a hotel room in New Jersey, which is six hours from where I lived. It's on the East Coast of the US for those international listeners. And my alarm clock went off. I sat up. I slid to the edge of the bed. I was lacing up my work boots. And Nicole, the best way to explain it, that morning it was like there was 10 televisions on in my head and every single one was on a different channel. And one is saying, you're stuck here forever. People like you don't get opportunities like this. Never mind, leave them behind. If you do leave, what will your friends think? You make more money than all your friends. There's significance there. If you do leave, what will your family think? You make more money than anybody in your family. There's significance there. And what are we going to do if we leave this behind? And that was the moment where, in my mind, if I took my life, I would take my problems with me. Now, I'm very blessed. I have supportive people around me. I messaged my now business partner and explained that to him. And he said, Kev, over the last few years, your awareness has changed a ton, but your environment, a word that you and I used in the preamble, your environment hasn't changed that much. I think it's time for you to change your environment. So that was very much the necessity for me to learn business. So I ended up leaving my job three or four months later. And I went from a six-figure income to $10,000 in the bank and $35,000 on credit cards. And it was like, okay, cool. Trial by fire. We got to figure this out. So it was more from necessity than, than design. I'm grateful I had the opportunity to learn it. I love business now. I love talking about business. But in the beginning, I had all the aversions. Money blocks, sales blocks, all of that, numbers blocks, all of that stuff. So I very much understand and empathize with anybody who hears that and says, "Mm, I don't know, business is not for me. You just never know until you try. So how did you get started? All of these things are happening and you're like, I just need to do something for myself. What did (laughs) that look like for you? It's it's interesting because it was a, a very much a hurry up and wait game. So now for all intents and purposes, I have 16 hours a day for for me to do whatever I want to grow this business, but I don't know what I'm doing. So in the very beginning, I started with simple habits. I I asked my business partner, I said, "What what do I do? And he said, you should pick five habits to start doing every single day. I would meditate, I journal, I track my finances, I track the listens, and I exercise for 30 minutes, just as an example. Honestly, in the beginning, and I know this might sound counterintuitive, The main goal was to work on myself as a human. If you want to have anything successful, you have to become the type of person who is capable of creating and sustaining that success first. And I just wasn't, transparently. I I wasn't a super well-developed man yet. I wasn't capable of leading a community of females like we have today. Like most of our audience is female-based, believe it or not. I wasn't there yet. I didn't have the character. I didn't have the vulnerability. I didn't have the leadership skills. I didn't have the self-awareness. So honestly, a little bit of the opposite of of what you might hear from other people, I didn't really work on the business at all for the first couple of years. And that's why I went broke and ended up $35,000 in debt. But in the very beginning, Alan and I had the conversations of, hey, man, we're not good enough men yet. We're not there. We're just not there. We're not ready for the responsibility that this could bring. Let's have the tough conversations. Let's work on ourselves. Let's face our insecurities. Let's talk about that stuff because eventually that usually becomes the downfall of somebody, right? And we were so afraid of that happening to us. We wanted to to work on that in the beginning. So that was the very beginning for us. It's just how do I become a better man? a better business partner, a better leader, all of those things. And so did that look like, I I guess you can kind of sum that all up as self-improvement. Did that look Mm. like figuring out a routine for yourself, whether it be journaling or figuring out, I don't like journaling, what's an alternative? What were the tangible actions that you took in those first few years? It was very much, I'm a very regimented human, which is why travel is hard for me at times because I want to do the same things in the same way every single day, because that's what 
I like to stick to routine. So for me, it was, it started with five habits and then it was like, all right, cool. Now that I have those down, let me add another habit. So now I'm going to send a message to a listener every day. Awesome. You know, I'm going to do, okay, once that was down, I started doing more stuff. Then we went from one episode to two. And then we went from two episodes to three. And the whole time, and you can speak to this as a podcaster, the whole time I'm interviewing people who are way more successful than me. And I'm trying to figure out my insecurities. I'm trying to figure out like, do I deserve any of this? Why is this person talking to us? Why do I always feel so scared before we do this? Am I ever going to be confident? Do I have any self-worth? Like a lot of it for me was just the self-awareness of who is Kevin as a human being without any of this. The tangible things for me were I would do something, I would try to recognize how I felt in the moment, and then I would reflect afterwards. Now I can do that in real time, right? You make me feel very safe in this moment, so it's easy for me to share this stuff. Like that's happening in my brain right now. I feel good. I feel safe. I feel connected. Cool. I couldn't do that before. So my, it was almost like my checklist after I finished something was on a scale of one to 10, how afraid was I? On a scale of one to 10, how courageous was I? What would I do differently? What would I do the same? What will I do next time? And then that was just, you know, it took me 150 podcast episodes to really feel good about podcasting, to, to really feel like a good interviewer, to really feel confident. But it was just based on that. It was, what am I doing every day? What are the five, six, seven habits? And then what can I use from my experience today to lock in a new level of confidence or, or self-worth? So in you saying this, it makes me think, do you think most people just going about their daily lives feel the same way that you felt? And in order to gain, whether it be like the confidence or the entrepreneurial skills, they really have to work on themselves. It's not something that really comes naturally to most people or potentially almost anybody. What's your opinion and take on that? Most people, here's the interesting thing. One of the reasons a lot of us get stuck, and this is what happened to me, I didn't have enough belief in myself, so I, I didn't set goals. If you don't have goals, you don't have necessity. There's no reason for me to do this interview if I don't have goals. And there's no reason for me to get better as a man if I don't have a, a wife who I want to be more supportive for. Like the, the goals determine the necessity. So this is something we've seen. There are, th this is kind of my analogy. When I'm working with somebody, they'll come to me and say, I just don't believe in myself enough. Cool. I completely understand. It's all good. Let me just ask you a question and let's see if that's true. On a scale of one to 10, how much do you believe you are capable of building a beautiful castle on the ocean? It's beautiful inside. It's beautiful outside. The landscaping's beautiful. It's amazing. You can smell the ocean. It's always beautiful. The weather's amazing. On a scale of one to 10, how much do you believe in your own unique ability to build that? And I, I asked somebody that recently and he was like 10. All right. On a scale of one to 10, how much do you believe you are actually worthy or belonging of moving in after you've built it. And he said, and he looked at me and went, he's like, I said, this is not a self-belief problem. This is a self-worth problem. So I think the, the issues that a lot of us are struggling with is if you struggle with low self-belief, you won't take a new action. If you don't take a new action, you won't get a new result. If you don't get a new result, you're always going to have proof that you shouldn't try. If you have low self-worth, you're probably going to self-sabotage your, yourself into not even trying because if you don't think you deserve money, you don't think you deserve success, dream relationship, whatever it may be, it's never going to accidentally happen. And if it does, you'll find a way to lose it. You'll find a way to self-sabotage. So yeah, I don't know if a lot of us are thinking from that perspective or it's just a baseline. I couldn't do that because or I don't deserve that because. And you got, there's always a layer and there's a layer under the layer. And if you dig for long enough, eventually you can get to the root. You mentioned at the very beginning about goal setting. And I want to talk to you about goal setting. I think you're a good person to talk to about goal setting. <laughs> but I think when most people think goal setting, they think of pulling out a checklist and writing down their goals and having that little tick box beside it. So what does, and this could look different for everybody too, what does setting look like or what are the, some of the common ways that you see people can set goals in order to succeed those goals? The simplest thing for me, regardless of whether it's on a whiteboard, whether it's on a checklist, whether it's on the background of your cell phone or your laptop, that, that part, you do you, whatever feels right. The biggest thing I have seen, Nicole, is most people set goals that are way too big. 
And I know that is anti what so many of us have been told. I think of it this way. There's a 3% goal. There's a 33% goal. There's a 66% goal, a 99% goal, and a 100% goal. A 100% goal is something that you believe within 100% of yourself that you can accomplish. So I believe with 100% of myself that I can get on one podcast and add value. It's, it's, I've done it enough times. It makes sense. Okay. A 3% goal is I believe I can make $1.5 million this year based on what we made last year. It's such an extravagant stretch that I know in my brain and in my subconscious that honestly, it's not going to happen. And if you don't think it's going to happen, you're never going to take action. That is what I would suggest. I would say, what is a three, a 33, a 66, a 99, and a 100? Because this is what you can, if you have a level 10 out of 10 self-belief, you can set 3% goals. It's not going to break you not to get them. And honestly, you're setting the goal for the growth more than the goal anyway, if you're at that level of belief. So it doesn't really matter. If you have a level one out of 10, you should probably set the 99 because I'm just looking for momentum, momentum over everything. It's a fine line. Some of us need to get the goal to get reignited to set another goal. Other people are actually motivated by not getting the goal because they're doing it for the growth. So long, long, long answer short, I would say you have to tap into the self-awareness to say, what is a constructive goal for me that I'm not going to beat myself up every single day if I don't make progress towards or whatever it may be? What will actually allow me to set another goal after I accomplish it? I think that's a really good question to ask. So is it better to not set that 3% goal at all or set it, but no, it won't be achieved for a while or just kind of set those 90% goals and work your way up? Is there a science behind your brain, what motivates you to work best to achieve those goals? I don't know the specific science. I, I was reading a book recently called The Art of Impossible by Stephen Kotler. We actually interviewed him a while ago. And he was talking about how your brain knows if you're BSing it. For a long time, people would say, your brain cannot differentiate between an imagined thought and reality. I don't know if that's actually scientifically accurate. Your brain Think of it this way. If you're standing at the edge of a cliff and there is a 40-foot jump between where you are and where you need to get to, and you tell your brain you can make this, your brain's going to be like, no, 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 no. My job is to keep you safe. I know you cannot make this. Do not do it. So I would say there are very few people that I've met that would benefit from 3% goals. My business partner is one of them. He does not set goals to accomplish the goal. He sets the goal to get the growth. And he, um, here's the thing though, his self-worth isn't attached to the goal. So if he doesn't make the money, get the client, whatever it is, he doesn't really, it doesn't affect him. So I would say 3% goals are for the high, 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 high achievers, like the visionary people who it almost doesn't affect them regardless of how bad they're winning or how bad they're losing. I would say, I think most people probably want to live in the eh, 66 to to 99% range is what I would guess. Yeah. Thinking about that, I'm just like, oh gosh, I don't think myself or many other people that I know would be within that 3% because it's very hard to detach your self-worth yes. or a piece of your self-worth from not achieving that goal or maybe your ego yes. is it's the better word. Yes. Well, and if you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to be able to set three. They're not going to be accurate. Yeah. It's not going to be an accurate 3% goal anyway. So you're not really doing yourself any favors. I, I really do more than ever. I, I feel like many of us have been lied to and, and not from a negative way. But if you think of a lot of the, the very quote unquote successful people, one of the common themes is most of them have incredible self-belief. And they're talking to a lot of people who do not have that level of self-belief and they don't know it. They think it's normal. They don't understand that they are playing with a card that many of us were not dealt. That's one of the reasons I try to to break things down into very simple forms because that's how I learned. I didn't resonate with that. If your goals don't scare you, they're not big enough, everything scares me. Everything scares me. I don't know. Is that good? Is that bad? So I try to break it down so I'd be able to understand it at the beginning of my journey because I didn't resonate with all of that stuff. It just didn't make sense. I could tell that it wasn't for me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I like that you broke it down that way because I think not everyone can resonate with those hugely successful people and maybe vice versa as well. So I want to go back to what you mentioned 
a little while ago, closer to the beginning, about living unconsciously. So Hmm. this brings up something for me because not that I was living unconsciously, but I found myself in a life where I knew I was going to start living unconsciously. Mm -hmm. So basically, a little bit of my backstory is I, you know, I think we're all sold the dream and maybe you were too in Western culture of going to school, getting a good education, getting the corporate job. I always had envisioned, you know, wearing the pantsuit into the office. And that was the dream for me in the big city. And Once I had a corporate position for about a year, even less than a year, I started thinking to myself, I don't know how the heck I'm going to do this for the rest of my life when I already can't do this for the first year. And I saw what the rest of my life, I was 21 years old. I saw what the rest of my life looked like. And I'm so passionate about this topic. I like to call it lifestyle design. I actually just was told the other day that apparently that's the term Tim Ferriss uses in his book, which I've I've never read, but I kind of Mm. know the premise of the four hour work week. Um, and I was like, that's I, that's interesting. I love that. But I call it lifestyle design because I saw my future. I saw if I stayed in the corporate position, I would move up the corporate ladder. I would get the mortgage. I would get the dog, the 2.5 kids, the car payment, you know, like kind of all of that. And like I always say, if people want that and are actively choosing that as a heck yes in their life, then that's amazing. I'm so happy mm-hmm. for them. But for me, I knew I wouldn't be happy in that lifestyle. So I had to figure out what does my lifestyle design look like? And then the second piece of that is how can I take action to actually achieve whatever that dream life looked like? And now six years later, here I am sitting here in Paraguay talking to you. Never would have expected it, but that's the beauty to me of this (laughs) lifestyle and what lifestyle design is. So I would, now you mentioned a little bit about living unconsciously, but I would love to hear a little bit more about your experience of living unconsciously, what that looks like in greater detail for you. I very much resonate. and I'm sure many, many, many people do. For me, it was just, it just was a lack of self-awareness. Unconscious living for me was just not understanding myself. I didn't know, okay, so one day I was in the gym and somebody came up to me and said, hey, you should be a bodybuilder. And I was like, I don't even know, what do you mean? Like, what are you talking about? And they said, you should do a show. And I was like, cool, keep talking. I don't know what you're talking about. And they said, you get on stage and you do a bunch of flexing and maybe you'll win a trophy. And I was like, awesome. I'm in. I'm going to do that. Let's do that. At the time, I thought I was doing it because I wanted to do it. I don't think that's why. I think I did it because I was getting significance for being in really good shape. That, that's, that was just an unconscious behavior for me. It was not understanding what actually drove me as a human being. So if you're not able to determine why you're actually doing something, odds are it's potentially an unconscious behavior. It's just you on autopilot. So if you, that's part one. And then part two is this. If you just do something because you've always done something, it's probably just become an unconscious habit. You just, if you don't know you're doing it, it's unconscious, right? Even, and this is the interesting thing. The way I speak in certain situations now is unconscious, but it's unconscious based on the fact that I want, I practiced it hyperconsciously. So now it's just second nature. I think the one of the best things for this is if you've never sat down and talked about to yourself your core beliefs, your core aspirations, and your core values. Those are three really good places to start because that what is that going to do? Awareness. What is awareness? Awareness is an opportunity for you to make a decision that's more in alignment. So if a core value for me is self-improvement, I'm talking about self-improvement. I'm blessed. Like The fact that you want to talk about this, I'm in. This is a core value of mine. A core belief might be you're one good decision away from changing your life. right? I have to believe in that because starting this was the best thing I ever, I ever did. And then a core aspiration. like What do you want to accomplish? right? I, I want to have the most successful self-improvement podcast on the planet eventually. I mean, that's why are we doing seven episodes a week? That's one reason. Why do I go on so many other shows, right? That's another reason. If you're, I guess, the the definition of unconscious in, in this situation, if your behaviors don't line up with the ultimate goals that you have based on your own unique playbook, not mine, not Nicole's, nobody's, but your own, based on your core beliefs, based on your core values, and based on your core aspirations, then if if I was to say what's intentional living, it's that right? Living in alignment is creating a lifestyle 
designing a lifestyle based on those things because at least you know you're in alignment and on purpose with them. I would love to chat about intentional living and also, of course, self-improvement through a lens of traveling or being nomadic. Like you mentioned, you have traveled pretty extensively in the past. It's a very different lifestyle to be nomadic. A lot of people listening either want to be nomadic or are starting out their nomad journey or traveling journey in general. But there are so many things to a traveling lifestyle that I think often get overlooked. It's very glamorized, over glamorized sometimes mm -hmm. to a point. But there's a lot of those fine details behind the scenes that you really only experience once you are in it. And I strongly believe that self-improvement is, is one of those. So what are some tips, some best practices that you could give to somebody who wants to continue leveling up, wants to improve their life? One of the big things is delaying pleasure in the moment for fulfillment long term. All I mean by that is if you're on a four hour plane ride, take an hour of that and listen to an audiobook. I know you don't want to most likely. I completely understand. I want to watch Netflix. I want to watch Netflix or whatever it may be, but you'll thank yourself later for doing that, right? If you're somebody who has a lot of either windshield time or sky time, you have the opportunity to learn a lot more than somebody who doesn't. And that's an opportunity and that's huge. Now, again, you have to balance short-term presence and long-term potential. And, and that's a fine line. The other thing I would say, and I can understand how this might be a challenge, but bring earplugs and bring a mask everywhere you go, like an eye mask. Because if you're sleeping in a bunch of places you've never been before, you're already fighting against the current in terms of like getting quality sleep because your body knows you're not at home. So anything you can do to block out the light, block out the sound, prioritizing sleep. Traveling is fulfilling, sure, but it's also a grind. It's also a grind. The other thing I would say is, and obviously this is dependent on where you are in the world, I used to have a, a gym membership to Anytime Fitness. So anywhere in the world I went, I would have access, anywhere in the world that had the gyms, I would have access to. You get a key fob, you sign in, you're off to the races. I think this is the, the ultimate through line. Yes. You want to feel maybe like you're on vacation and you want to experience the culture and you want to have that quote unquote freedom. But the thing that allowed you the freedom in the first place was the fact that you poured into yourself and you worked on yourself and you developed yourself personally. So those are a few, I would say, obviously make sure you have some sort of quality water bottle. You're going to be able to fill up often because you're going to be dehydrated with all the traveling. But I really think if I could say anything, it's turn your car, turn your plane, turn your bus, turn your bicycle into a classroom because that is a, a, a large opportunity for you to take time to learn and that pays off forever. And that makes me think of really habit. So yep. when you were mentioning about, you know, the Netflix movie or the podcast, I think mm -hmm. for myself, I have gotten into such a habit of any time I fly or I'm on a bus. I enjoy listening to podcasts more than I enjoy watching a movie, but that wasn't always the case, but it became yeah. a habit of me thinking to myself, this is one of the only times I'm going to have no distractions and absolutely nothing else to do. So I may as well learn. I have my notes app. My notes app is like, I just have it notes for the plane. And I just mm. write everything that I've been thinking, everything I've gathered from podcasts I've listened to, or sometimes audiobooks. But I think it really comes down to making a habit. And then and I'm sure you can speak to this a lot is seeing yourself as a person who listens to podcasts on the plane, not yep. watches Netflix on the plane. And I've even recently been like, should I delete Netflix on my phone? Because I just <laughs> I never use it anymore. Well, there are very few times where you don't have anything to do. Now, a lot of people say I have my best thoughts in the shower. I would guess if you have your best thoughts in the shower, you don't have a shower radio. I'm willing to bet you probably sit there in silence. That's probably the reason I can't fall asleep at night. I'm willing to bet that's probably the first time you've been with yourself, by yourself, with your thoughts. It makes sense. Like your brain's always running. So I think that's a really good perspective. If the other, and I would add a couple things too. One, understand, and again, you have way more travel abroad than I do, but understand your relationship with your comfort zone in travel. 
if you traveling is putting you way outside your comfort zone, it's like the anxiety zone, the last thing in the world you're going to want to do is learn. 100%. It's not sustainable. It doesn't make sense logically. Understanding, okay, this is my first big trip. I'm going to be away for the longest I've ever been away. Let me figure out how that looks before I start practicing habits or let me do something extremely easy where I'm going to meditate for five minutes a day. I'm going to try to get X amount of steps in and I'm going to drink a gallon of water. And tracking your finances would probably be good because you're going to be traveling. Something simple to start, you can always build. Start with sustainability, create consistency through sustainability, and then focus on the improvement through consistency. You can always run that system again, but traveling can be stressful, right? So when we're stressed out, the last thing we're thinking about is long-term. We're mostly thinking of present survival. So just again, another self-awareness thing of what is your stress reaction to travel, right? For me, it's food. Give me the food and I will be good. But for other people, maybe it's needing more sleep or reclusing from other humans, depending on who you are. I like that you mentioned sustainability in there. That really stuck out to me because that, for, for me at least, is, is really the only word you need. Sustainability. You yeah. need to figure out what is sustainable for you. And again, that'll look different for every individual person. But what looks sustainable for you? And just kind of go from there. My partner and I, a year ago, we were traveling in Europe. And we were every like five to seven days in a new Airbnb. And for us, it was amazing and great, but that wasn't so sustainable. So now we like to stay for a few weeks at a time Mm. and we get into a bit of a routine and we know the area. Yes. And then we leave and then it's like a whole new area, but we enjoy that. That's part of the fun. But we realized what we were doing before was not as sustainable for us. We've also stayed in some places for like a month or two and we're like, that's too long. That's not sustainable on the other end. So Mm. I think it's really figuring out what you said, what works best for you. So in saying all of this, this has been an amazing discussion so far. I need to talk to you about the business side of things, entrepreneurship. First of all, your business, is that mostly the podcast? Are there other sections of your business? Do you do anything else in the online business space? So we're a very interesting creature where we don't do sponsorships or ads or affiliates or anything like that. We could, we have enough listens where we could do that and we can make money doing that. But for us, we decided early on, it's not about us, it's about the audience. I have a firm belief that if you serve the audience to a greater quality and in a greater depth than anybody else, they will keep coming back and eventually you'll be able to monetize through that. So yeah, the podcast is always free, no ads, no sponsorships, none of that. Below the podcast, we do one-on-one coaching, we do group coaching, we have retreats, we have live events, we have Next Level Social Media, which does social media, we have Next Level Podcast Solutions, which does podcasts. Alan coaches people, I coach people. So for us, we have really used the podcast as an opportunity to add value. And then when people logically say, I would like to get more value, where do I go? Cool, go down here. Or you know, maybe you want a free course or whatever it may be. That was, that was really the thought in the beginning. What started to happen was I would get asked a lot of questions about the problems that we have already solved, and then we would just build out a part of the business for that. So somebody came to me and said, hey, I need help with my podcast production. It's like, oh, yeah, we know we can do that. We've done 500 episodes at this point. Cool. That became a pretty big part of our business. The social media side of things is growing now. So, yeah, we figured out what are the top five problems that we have learned to solve and that we've already said, oh, is there enough demand? Are people looking for that? Awesome. Then we kind of grew that out as the business as well. So we have part of the business that serves our community. And then we also have part of the business that serves people who want to create communities like we have. So it's kind of a double a double perspective there, I guess. I find this very interesting that a lot, I don't know what percentage, but I'm guessing more than 50% of your listeners are females. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. So I would love to hear how you built out a brand slash podcast being two men and having a very female based audience. I think that's very interesting because myself, as obviously a woman, I resonate a lot more a lot of the time and talking to you, you know, we're having a great discussion so I can understand it. But a lot of the time on podcasts, I can resonate with the women than the men a lot Mm. more because our perspectives as males and females are just very different. I would Mm. love to hear what that journey has looked like for you. It's it's interesting. In the beginning, it wasn't the goal. I thought my goal was to be like Joe Rogan, 
I think most most people start podcasts. I'm like, yeah, I'd like to be able to get to that level. And then what happened was I would get reached out to by people and I'd go check my DMs and it was always women. And I was like, okay, whatever. I'm I'm cool with that. Then what happened from there was, and again, we, we have built this based on just one-on-one conversations, scale the unscalable. I work a lot. Like that's obviously part of it, right? I'm pretty much working every day. I would send them my phone number and I'd say, hey, let's hop on a FaceTime. I, I just, I don't have anything to sell. I'm not a coach. I'm nothing at this point. I just want to get to know you. I want to know what you're dealing with. I want to know what you're struggling with. I want to know how much money you make, where you live, what your partner's like, what your dreams are. And I would just hop on these, these 30 minute FaceTimes with our listeners. And we started to see these common themes. And almost always, almost always, there was a toxic part. What I think started to happen, and I, I'm always, it's always weird for me to talk about this side of things. But what I think started to happen was the women who found us said, oh my goodness, there are men like that out there who talk about their feelings and who cry on the podcast and are vulnerable and aren't a super hyper-masculine or toxic masculine. They talk about their feelings. That's part one. I think the other part of it too is a lot of our community comes to us after they have tried the like the super life of ease where everything's supposed to work out the way it's supposed to work out at the time it's supposed to work out. And they didn't get the results they wanted, but they also went all the way over to don't sleep, grind your face off. It doesn't, your family doesn't matter. Your feelings don't matter. We're in the middle. I believe heavily in the law of attraction. I believe in the energetics. I believe in spirituality. I also believe that you have to be consistent. You have to be disciplined, but I don't think you don't have to see your family and you have to work every single day for the rest of your life. That, I, I really think it's that. It's the harmonization of being able to be yourself, but also get the results you want without losing yourself. But that's just because we've been studying this every single day. So I think that's part of it. And honestly, I don't know. I Our team's 80% women too. They, they just say that we feel like we just feel safe here. I, I don't know. I don't know how to replicate that. I think it's just based on at this point, we have so many episodes. So if you if you hear me, you're gonna hear a pretty consistent version of Kev. You can only fake it for so long. I, I would have lost it, you know, long before now. So I think that's a big part of it. And then transparently, we have a core wound in our community of low self-worth. I had very, very low self-worth in the beginning. So I can speak to somebody who has low self-worth and low self-belief. The person I struggle to speak to, especially to impact, is somebody who has super high self-worth and super high self-belief. I've never been there. I don't know. I can't resonate. I, I don't know if I can add value. But if you struggle with believing in yourself and valuing yourself, I know that that world all too well, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I can totally see that. Talking to you, I, I do see that you are more vulnerable. So I can see, like I said, how you have built up a community of women. And you kind of remind me of Lewis Howes. I like to listen to his podcast and it's just very open and vulnerable. Now, I'd like to talk about, and maybe you have already touched on this a little bit, but scaling your business, what does that look like? And then as part of that hustle culture, you mentioned, you know, you work every day, but it's not a grind. Has there ever been a point where it has been kind of a grind or you've overworked yourself? Has hustle culture ever been a part of your business? And how did you deal with that? If so, yeah, uh, let me start there. My belief on hustle culture is don't don't practice what I practice. It's It's always kind of been that because here's the thing. If I really mean, and I do mean this, I, I would really like to have the most successful self-improvement company on the planet. I genuinely, I mean that my bones, that's what I'm playing for. I'm going to have to work more than 99.9% .9 of you listening, unless your goals are that big. And if they are, awesome. I love that. But if they're not, you don't have to do things the way I do. You don't have to, you don't have to work as much as I do. And honestly, if I told you to, I'd be misleading. You. So my life is still very much a grind, but it's an aligned grind. I love doing this. You know, I do right now, I don't know, 15, 20 podcast episodes a week. But I love this. I love podcasting. The fact that I get to do this for a living is amazing. It's amazing. So I'm, I'm very blessed. So I do, I hustle hard. There's two of us. Alan works seven days a week. I'm working every day. Now, the other side of it, though, is I'm also very, very disciplined with my self-care. So I pretty much work, depending on when I get up, usually like 5 a.m., I'll go to the gym, and I work until like 6 p.m. usually. When I start to get burnt out, I take note of it. And Alan and I have a conversation. I say, hey, man, I need to close my calendar for a bit. I'm burning down. I am burning down. 
cool, Kev, no worries, do your thing. So I, I just want to make that, I want to throw that out there. The other part of it too is I don't, the level of effort you put in is always going to be la- based on the level of results you want out. So just knowing that about yourself is, is super, super important. The way we scaled it really was delegating and bringing people on that believed in the mission, right? There, there's only two of us and there's only so much we can do. So early on, what we did is we found people from within the community and we said, hey, we're looking for team members. I know you listen to the show. Do you want to be on the team? Like, this is what we're, this is what we're doing. This is what you'd be doing. And that was really, really big for us because there's no better person for your team than somebody from your community, right? That really was what it was. And then, then anytime we, we had a, an opportunity to monetize something, it was like, all right, that team needs to grow faster. So the podcast team is, is big, cool. Social media team has grown a lot. So content is easy to scale because we're doing seven episodes a week. At, that, at this point, it's not super challenging because we've done it enough. But under there, it's like, okay, how many people do we need to have the level of impact that we want to have to monetize to the level we need to? But for us, it's been really, really delegating intentionally where people are living in their genius zones, right? There's only, there's only so many podcast episodes I can do, but there's nobody on the team that can do the podcast episodes like I do. Alan, my, my business partner, he's the strategist. I cannot strategize like him. He's a genius. I don't have that. That's his genius zone. Really, it's been deploying human beings to do their genius zone based on the fact that they can do it better than I can do it. And it would be wrong for me to assume otherwise. Interesting. One thing you mentioned that that I was going to ask was burnout. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I know you love what you do, which is the core piece of it all. Yeah. But doing, what did you say, 12 to 15 episodes per week on top of running your entire business? Like that's wild. So- Burnout. I mean, it, do you kind of just like close everything off for a set amount of time, or how are some other ways that you deal with that? I'm very, I'm very, very familiar with what fills my cup. That's a, that's a big thing. Is you know, I don't go. I'm a very simple human, so like, I don't party on the weekends. I don't, I don't do any of that. For me, that's not. It doesn't fill my cup. I know watching the fights on Saturday, eating Taco Bell in front of the TV, that fills my cup. Sunday date day with my wife, that fills my cup. So there's that. And then honestly, the interesting thing about burnout for us is the stuff that, Nicole, I'm not even kidding. I remember when I used to do one coaching call a day and I would have to go lay down after. It was like, that's it. I can't book anything else. Today, my calendar was booked from 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. back to back to back to back to back with no breaks. I mean, back to back, no, no breaks. Now, a couple of those got canceled. So but it's that. It's like what's burning me out today, honestly, probably will not be that much of a challenge in another year. I haven't reached the upper limit yet. When I do get burnt out, I recluse. I take like a full day. You know, I'll take a full day Saturday and say, okay, I'm not working Saturday. I'm not working Sunday. Then I get back. But we're doing a lot of R&R based on the fact that I want to be productive the next day. Not necessarily because I want to take r and I mean, I do. I love it. But this all came much to your point, from last year where I did, I did so many podcasts in a month where I like lost my voice. I got physically ill because I was just going, going, going. Then I went from doing like 12 shows a week to back to like 10 to eight. So we dialed back the amount of effort is probably the best way to the, to the, not the comfort zone, but the learning zone. Right, I was living in anxiety. Like, I cannot do this again tomorrow. Okay, let me try. Oh, I can't do this again tomorrow. Let me try. To, okay, this is going to be a challenge, but it's a challenge that I can handle. And if not, I'll dial back. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, everyone deals with burnout so differently, but it's interesting to hear how you do. But I think, you know, the, the core piece of what it all comes down to is if you're doing what you love, you can take the break, but you're always going to get back on that horse. And especially yeah. if you're building something for yourself, too. Yeah. I don't want to. There's, there's a level of gratitude. I'm, bl- I'm very blessed. The fact that I can wear pajamas, like, from the waist down and nobody would ever know. And, like, that's my life and I get to do that. The fact that I'm at my house right now and I can go walk 15 steps and see my wife like that. There's a lot of benefits with the perceived pressure that comes with it. But there, there is a lot of pressure. But I, I go back to the, the really the goals. If, if tomorrow I decide, you know what, I'm good. Like, I'm just going to let this kind of run the way it should. Or I'm going to see myself out. My life would look drastically different. But until that day, which I do not foresee ever happening, I'm okay with 
hinging on burnout because that's kind of what I signed up for. I think that's an important thing, right? Is like, I signed up for this. And a lot of you out there, if you're listening, you didn't sign up for burnout. You didn't sign up to grind your face off for somebody else's dream. I understand. Trust me. When I quit my job, I realized this is going to be the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. And I will dedicate my life to accomplishing this. I'm okay with that. Core beliefs, core values, core aspirations, they're all connected to the podcast. So, all right. So my last question for you, this has been a very interesting episode. I have (laughs) to ask, you've recorded, you said almost 1400 episodes of your podcast. What have been some of your biggest takeaways that you have learned throughout your podcasting? Two things, two, two big ones I usually say. One, from day to day, progress is invisible. From year to year, progress is impossible to miss. So I recorded five episodes yesterday. I did whatever today. I am no better. And if I am, it is minuscule and not able to be measured. But go back and listen to the first one and it will make you cry how bad it is. It's terrible. It's absolutely garbage, but you don't see that. If we quit after the first year, we would have said, yeah, I didn't, I just didn't get that good. If we quit after the second year, nothing that happened in the third year would have happened. So that duality has been very, very, very important to me. And here's the other one too. In this moment, this interview that you and I have is the only thing that matters to both of us, right? Like we're, we're very present. If you keep doing this for the next 10 years, this doesn't matter almost at all. It's the duality of everything matters, but everything kind of doesn't matter based on the amount of time you do it. I make a lot of mistakes on the podcast. I make a mistake on every podcast. And for the longest time it was, I'm not good. People are going to laugh at me. I'm going to look like an idiot. When in reality, it's like, honestly, if I fail more than everybody else, I'm actually going to be way more successful than everybody else eventually. It's just not going to look like it for a long period of time. It doesn't matter today. It doesn't matter tomorrow. What it adds up to eventually is what really matters. And then I would say the last thing is I've just seen the ability of a human being to grow in real time. Just our audience, clients, our team. It's it's really wild what can happen when you have the right people in your corner. And it's really scary what can happen when you have the wrong people in your corner. And that is something we have seen on on both ends of of this journey so far. I'm sure you could dive into that so much more. I'd be <laughs> interested, but we don't have time for that. But in you saying that, I want to know, how how long have you been doing this podcast for? How many years? Started in 2017. So what's that? Six years? Six, Six years. Six years and wow. two months. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> dedication. I was listening to, I love consuming Alex Hermosi's content. Big so fan. I was listening to... One of his podcasts or YouTube or something a while ago, and he was saying he started, I think, also around 2017. And he was like, my first, I don't remember what it was, like a few hundred episodes were horrible and yep. nobody listened to them. But now it's six years later and look where he is. So yep. that really put it into perspective for me and what you're saying as well. The fact that nothing happens overnight. Sometimes like, yes, you can see the growth absolutely from one year to the next, but it doesn't mean there is an ultimate explosion in that growth that brings you to, you know, the Hermosi level or (laughs) your level doesn't mean that that's going to happen in a year or two. It really comes down to being consistency. And I think making that consistency a habit so that it's sustainable for you, not just something I'm going to do this for one or two months or six months, but there's an end date. Imagine a relationship where you got in, you're like, "Eh, I'm just going to kind of see how it goes. Yeah. All right. Good. I would bet a million dollars is most likely not going to succeed just because the improvement, the consistency, sustainability, and then improvement. Can I just add one more thing quickly? Absolutely. You got me fired up. One of the other thoughts that this is, it's really helped me, the, the podcast and all of this and meeting so many successful people, we assume that where somebody is today, so you just said it, Hormozy, we assume that where somebody is today is where they've been forever. We assume that where we are today is where we're going to be forever. Neither of those are true. Absolutely not. You just don't see Taylor Swift when she was 12 strumming away at a, at a festival with one person. Like, you don't see that. So just that, that understanding of it's very hard to see other people's paths because you don't really live their paths and you kind of only see them when they get to the top of the mountain. I'm glad you added that. And it makes me think of, I remember a while back reading about Lady Gaga, how she was playing in random New York bars for years. And yeah. now she's a household name and it's like, Lady Gaga playing in a dive bar in New York, you would never associate that with her. But that's what she did for years and years. And I believe that almost everybody who is someone who is somewhere 
it's it's the saying, you know, what is it? An overnight success is never overnight. Yeah. I love to know, keep that saying in mind to just keep everything in perspective. You don't know yes. how long it's going to take, but you have to have that consistency. 100%. Forever. Like you said, we'll do it forever. Forever. Exactly. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I have had such a great time chatting with you. Where can people find you and your podcast, your business online? I always just say search the podcast. That's where you're going to learn about us anyway. Just search Next Level University. We're on all the podcast platforms as well as YouTube. That is the, the easiest way to find us. You've just listened to the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast. If anything from this episode resonated with you, I would appreciate if you share this podcast on your socials. And of course, be sure to tag me. And don't forget to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you for joining me on this global citizen journey, and I'll see you in the next episode.